YouTube and then we will get started talking about uh, communications union district needs. We so good morning. This is the uh, Vermont House Government Operations Committee. Uh, we are meeting this morning to go over some language that would make some adjustments um, for the benefit of communications union districts uh, who may have some uh, some challenges uh, operating remotely and uh, and conducting their business during the uh, pandemic uh, state of emergency. So welcome and thank you for being with us. Um, I think I'm going to ask, uh, since John Gannon was working on this uh, to begin with, I'm going to ask you, John, if you would just uh, sort of frame up the discussion that we're going to have here for us. Sure. Sure. Um... So th this initially came up um, um, in our window after our Wyndham County um, delegation meeting last Saturday, um, when we met virtually with um, Jeanette White and I met virtually with uh, Laura Sibilia, um, who told us that um, Rob Fish had informed her that um, some CUDs could not form um, because of the challenges of holding a special meeting. Um, during the COVID-19 crisis. So, I mean, this is something we've heard um, with respect to other issues such as, and so that, that was the main issue um, that came up was, and there was at least three um, areas of the, the state, Lamoille, Rutland, and I'm um, forgetting the third one where this could be a potential issue for them forming a CUD. And for, for people who are not familiar with it, what a CUD or communication union district is, um, this is a way for towns to organize, to bring broadband um, uh, into their communities. Um, it basically creates a separate municipality um, that allows um, them to, to get grants from the state and potentially set up um, a broadband network in their communities. Um, there's a number of them already um, established uh, across the state. And so that was one of the main issues and then when I started looking at the statute, um, there was a couple of other issues that needed cleaning up um, with respect to this. Um, for example, um, appointments after you form a CUD in the legis in the in the statute said you couldn't actually appoint people to it until a year after um, it had been formed, uh, which I don't think was the intent when this was passed because that would basically have you'd have a year of um, of nothing happening. Um, so. That's a modification that's proposed in this language. It also, the, the statute is very written towards forming um, CUDs at town meeting in March. And so there are a couple of modifications with respect to um, making it uh, more clear that if you're um, establishing a CUD either uh, by special meeting or by select board that, you know, you can appoint members to it um, within a certain period of time after that, and you can hold your organizational meeting within a certain period after that. So that's what this proposes to do. I think it, it makes, it, it strengthens the statute and, you know, allows CUDs to form um, this year. And I think Rob Fish can explain why that might be important. So thank you. Great, thank you so much. So uh, let's throw this over to Rob Fish, uh, who is the Rural Broadband Technical Assistant Specialist at the Department of Public Service. Thank you for being with us this morning, Rob. Thank you for having me, Madam Chair. Thank you for this opportunity. And thank you for addressing this important issue that's coming up in these unprecedented times. Uh, as a little background in the initial legislation, in order to form a communication union district, you had to have a vote at town meeting. This was designed as a way to ensure that the community has been involved in the process. Uh, in the wake of COVID-19, there is no way to have such a town meeting. I can also say that for each of these different groups, especially the group in Lamoille County, they have been meeting with their community for months now. So I feel like the intent is still the same and this change as well as the other housekeeping changes are necessary to keep things moving along and to allow these groups to potentially participate in some federal programs and to just keep moving the state along during this unprecedented time towards expanding broadband. I'm happy to take any questions. I also uh, sent over a few maps showing where the current communication union districts are and where things are going if that's, if that's helpful to share. 
Great. Uh, and Andrea has posted those on our committee page. So if any folks are following along and would like to take a look at those maps, um, they are available uh, in our documents. Uh, does anybody have any questions for Rob or, uh, or more generally? All right, I am not seeing any uh, hands. So I'm going to invite uh, Leah Kilva Diava. Did, how did I do? <laughs> I appreciate the, the help um, uh, with your name pronunciation. And I understand that you are, um, you are looking at some communications union districts in Lamoille County. So uh, please share your thoughts with us. Right now, I am not hearing you because perhaps you're muted. You don't appear to be muted. The broadband isn't the greatest up there. Can you hear me now? <laughs> yes, absolutely. That sounds better. All right, then. Um, technological issue, a small one. <laughs> um, so thank you very much for having me today. Um, I am going to speak about the work that we have been doing in Lamoille County. And um, Madam Chair, you nailed the pronunciation of my name. Uh, my name is Laya Kilvadiova, and I work as regional planner at Lamoille County Planning Commission. Our commission serves 10 towns and five incorporated villages in Lamoille County. And I have been involved with broadband planning on municipal and regional levels for about a dozen years now, on and off. And the momentum for broadband that exists throughout the state today is amazing. Um, I'm very grateful to have an opportunity to testify on the proposed legislation for an alternative way to form a communications union district. If passed, the proposed legislation will help our municipalities in pursuing the creation of a CUD. Um, additionally, as also Rob Fish had mentioned a while ago, I have confirmed with the executive directors of Addison Regional Planning Commission and Rutland, Rutland Regional Planning Commission this morning that their member municipalities could also benefit from this legislation. Um, a little bit more about our work. Um, following the enactment of Act 79, uh, LCPC has been working with Lamoille County Towns to understand the opportunities that this broadband legislation provides. We spent time educating ourselves on the status of connectivity in our region. We studied examples of successful broadband deployment, both in Vermont and New Hampshire, and our communities held presentations and conducted broadband surveys at the recent 2020 town meeting. Um, as Rob had mentioned, I believe that this essentially community engagement work has prepared us well for applying for a broadband innovation grant also enabled by Act 79, which we were just awarded. So we are very pleased with that. And the community engagement work prepared us very well also for approaching our select boards with a request to create a governing entity to coordinate broadband deployment in our region. Um, as holding a special town meeting is not an option at this time, and select boards would likely be hesitant to organize a public vote via Australian ballot, which is an option that exists today. However, the hesitance stems from the fact that the select boards would prefer not to expose poll workers and the general public, public to the coronavirus. Um, this proposed legislation is really the best way for our municipalities to move forward. Um, I can speak more uh, on the hesitation of uh, holding an Australian ballot and provide an example if that's going to be a question. Um, I would close by saying that our municipalities really wish to be an active player in a broadband deployment. And 
at our most recent meeting of our regional broadband working group, which we held as recently as last night, this desire to form a CUD was reaffirmed by our group's representatives from six Lamoille towns. Um, Bill, uh, I have a small example again from the town of Waterville, uh, providing a statement in support of my testimony, which I will read out. Um, and that statement attests the readiness of our towns to move forward. So before I read the statement, thank you for, or your, for your work on this legislative proposal. It's very much appreciated. And here is a statement from Jeff Tilton from Waterville. Hi, Leah. Thanks for hosting tonight. I think the takeaway I, I got was that there is community interest in forming a Lamoille area CUD, but it is clear that it is going to take some considerable effort to gain momentum towards doing so, especially in the current climate. I'm fairly versed in the basics of CUDs and have a good feel for the Waterville community interest. I know the select board would like to see this go through as well. To that end, anything that I can do to help in the meantime, please let me know. Thank you. Thank you. That is very helpful context setting. Um, I think what would be helpful right now is if we could switch over to Tucker and have Tucker um, take us through the language so that we can see uh, exactly what it is uh, we are looking at for language. And then I would love to hear from um, Karen or Gwen. Um, I think we have Karen with us and, um, and, and hear the perspective of the League of Cities and Towns. So Tucker, take it away. Absolutely. Uh, so the bill you have before you has three operative provisions. One is a temporary provision and the other two are permanent amendments to statute. I will start in section one, which is a temporary provision uh, governing the uh, entry into a communications union district um, during the COVID-19 response. This section states that notwithstanding the provisions of Title 30 that govern the formation of a communications union district that requires a vote by the eligible voters at an annual or special meeting uh, during the declared state of emergency due to COVID-19, that the legislative body of a municipality may vote to enter into a communications union district under the provisions of 30 VSA chapter 82. That is the chapter that governs communications union districts. The one piece that I will uh, note here, um, I did not uh, draft this bill um, and Maria Royal, who did draft the bill may be able to help you further with this. Um, one question that I have is whether this needs to be clarified that the communications union district can be formed in this manner. It states expressly that the legislative body may vote to enter into a communications union district and the way that that section uh, 3051 is constructed, there is a difference between authority to form the district and to enter the district. Formation of the district requires a simultaneous vote by two or more municipalities. Um, so I will put that note in there for you. Thank you. Section two is an amendment to statute uh, this will be a permanent change and Representative Gannon noted it earlier. Uh, first, 30 VSA section 3059 uh, deals, the section deals with the appointment of represent, representatives to the CUD by the municipalities. And the amendment that is made here, uh, as Representative Gannon described, uh, it removes some language that required that appointment to be made in the year following the effective date of the district's creation uh, and allows the municipality under new language that you'll notice on line 11, uh, that the initial appointments may be made within 60 days of the vote to form the district and the, the initial terms may be for less than one year. Essentially what this would allow is uh, if the CUD is formed, municipality enters into it, 
uh, and there is less than a year before the next appointment date uh, that a member can be appointed within 60 days, their term would expire at the next opportunity to uh, reappoint. Similar change is made in section three to 30 VSA section 3060. This deals with the organizational meetings of the CUD and uh, the language that is added here starting on line 20 of page two allows the board's initial organizational meeting to be held within 90 days of the vote to form the district under subsection 3051 sub B of title 30. Um, that is the walkthrough. The bill would be effective on passage. Um, and again, I would note uh, some focus maybe on the difference between entering into the CUD and forming it. And I would direct the committee to some of the background here outside of chapter 82. Um, union municipal district districts in general, um, the provisions that govern them are in title 24, chapter 121. And there is uh, some more specific requirements there for how the union municipal districts are formed. And there are cross references in 30 VSA chapter 82 to powers that are conveyed when these districts are formed under title 24. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Rob LeClaire. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. And I, I'm not sure, Tucker, if you can answer this or not, as far as I, the, I know there's underlying language that this is um, connected to. But my question is, does anybody know, because I understand what we're trying to do here, but does anybody know what this commits the municipality to as far as to become a member of this? Meaning uh, there's been some other things, whether it be regional ambulance services or emergency services or other things like that, that community can get committed to some pretty substantial costs and obligations initially. And I'm just, does anybody know by allowing, by getting into this, what it commits to the community to? So that's sort of along the lines of question that I had, and I was hoping that maybe Rob Fish could help us understand, um, you know, some of the context around the formation of communication union districts. And I can very much appreciate the desire to make sure that these are, um, you know, that there's broad participation among the members of a community in entering uh, one of these. But Rob, what, how? enlighten us on this. Certainly. So the idea of a communication union district is to allow towns to work together as well as protect towns from the risk that's associated with expanding broadband, with con constructing and operating a communications plant. Communications union districts are currently prohibited from receiving tax-derived funds from a municipality. So to answer of what the risk is, the financial risk to a municipality, it's incredibly limited. I get the municipal, these districts are funded entirely by the revenues from what they produce, from what their assets are. Um, ideally, it's going to be revenue bonds or grants or loans. Does that help, Rob? Um, well, that's, that's down the road, correct, as far as how you're going to stand it up and how you're going to operate it. But let's just say, hypothetically, you make the decision to, get, to become a part of this, and then for whatever the reason, you decide not to pursue it. Okay, uh, it, it is easy to also withdraw from a district uh, via a select board vote. Okay, and does the community, is there any substantial financial investment on their part to there get is, to that point? There is no financial investment up to that point to get okay, to be able to withdraw. The communities are protected. Okay. Thank you. Jim Harrison. Yeah, that's a question for Rob. Uh, so how do these districts address uh, who participates? Uh, for example, in, in my community, which certainly has some big gaps in broadband, um, those that have cable, for example, might have no interest in 
participating or funding this and those like me who have limited uh, internet capabilities might be very interested. So uh, how do you make the numbers works if it's it's only a segment that um, you know is 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 willing to participate? Well, that's one of the reasons why to create a communication union district. There are a lot of towns where the center of town may be built out with cable, but the outlying areas only have DSL or less. Those segments are going to be bordering on segments in other towns across, across the municipal boundaries. When it comes to broadband expansion, municipal boundaries don't matter. It's a matter of where the roads go and what the topography is. Does that address the question? I, I think so. I guess through their planning, they would need to know whether or not they have the critical mass to pay for it. Obviously, you couldn't yes. set up a district with, you know, one potential subscriber uh, because the numbers wouldn't work. Um, grants or no grants. Uh, but um, so I guess that would be part of the planning then is what you're saying. Yeah, so that's part of the planning. Each of these districts are going to have to undergo some feasibility and business planning. And that's why we were happy to provide uh, Lamoille County with one of our broadband innovation grants. Uh, as soon as the papers are signed, they're going to be starting on uh, developing a feasibility plan to show that such a project is feasible in their area. OK, thank you. Great. Leah, do you have some information to uh, to share on that? Um, I would just add that in one principle of communication union district is that they do have an interest of the entire community in mind. And so the approach towards a potential build out is from um, is to focus on areas that are underserved or unserved right now. And that would be defined as not having a connection with the speed of of 25 over three megabits per second. Um, in fact, the communications union district so far that I've seen, uh, another reason why they're focusing on that, on those areas is because it's understood that the take rate in areas that already have the connectivity of 25 over three, uh, the take rates might be uh, lower. Um, so, and as Rob said, yes, the feasibility studies will help to determine what is the size of the area and whether the area can make a business case. Great. Committee, any other questions for any of the witnesses we have heard from so far? All right, so I am going to ask Karen Horn if she would like to share um, the perspective of VLCT on this language. Thank you. Uh, this is Karen Horn for the League of Cities and Towns. We do support this language. The communications union districts are one very effective mechanism to actually get broadband to all the parts of the state that need it. And um, Rob, I, I think Rob's map will show you the, all the communications union districts that are in place already. I do know that there's a really substantive uh, planning process that goes on uh, as a communications union district tries to assess where to build out first and what kinds of um, finances they're going to need, you know, where they're going to derive their finances for, uh, for building out the system. And it's very true that a lot of communities, it's just a portion of town that's underserved. And so they, they're part of their, uh, part of the issue that they need to address is how is this gonna work in those areas of town? And I, I would say that it doesn't obligate the community financially at all, the, the municipality, I mean, that's the town because um, it's not gonna be municipal tax dollars that support this, um, this community union, communications union district. So we do support the bill. We, we think it's important. I, I do think that the section two, because we've been involved in these discussions legislatively for some time. And I do think that if the, if the language reads that you're supposed to um, appoint your, representatives a year after uh, the creation of the district, it, that's not 
really what the intent was. The intent was that you would be able to create the district, appoint your representatives and get moving. Thank Great. you. Thank you, Karen. Um, committee, any questions on uh, what we've heard so far? So I guess I have a question for, uh, for Rob Fish. I would love to know, were you involved in the, uh, in the initial passage of this language out of House Energy and Technology? I was not involved in the uh, initial language, but uh, I am a beneficiary of it as my, my position was created in, in Act 79. So I've been on board since November. Great. Well, we thank you for your work, and I'm sure that there are a lot of Vermonters who are eagerly awaiting the, <laughs> the benefits of having formed a, a CUD and uh, now more than ever. Um, thank you. Rob LeClaire has a question. Uh, just a quick one, I think for probably Tucker. I just want to make sure I under, section one is considered temporary. The other two would be permanent changes, meaning section one would only come into play why the COVID-19 um, emergency period is in effect, correct? Correct. The authority to enter into the agreement is temporary and tied to COVID. However, the community would be bound under the CUD terms in Chapter 82 beyond the COVID response. Thank you. Great. Um, any, any other thoughts from committee members on this? First, just, uh, just one other thing I want to, what Tucker said in terms of clarifying the language to make sure it's about creating a communications union district, I think is, is incredibly important. Currently, a community can vote by select board to join an existing district, but not create one. So I want to just reemphasize that, that point that that's one thing that should be clarified. Yes, absolutely. Um, so um, I appreciate that very much, and um, and thank you to Tucker and uh, through Tucker to Maria Royal for working on um, developing this language. I think what we'll do um, at this point is shift gears to the other topic that's on our agenda, and my intention with this language will be to make sure that we have given the House Energy and Technology Committee an opportunity to take a peek at it and tell us if they have any red flags. Um, and, uh, and if they have any other improvements that they would like to offer to the language. Um, so John Gannon, since you've been working on this, would you be available to, or would you be able to make yourself available to House Energy and Technology for that conversation? Of course. Thank you. <laughs> You're the best. <laughs> Um, so thank you to Leah and Rob for being with us on communication union districts this morning, and um, we will intend to get this language um, through the committee process to appear on the floor of the House within the week, I would think. Um, so by hopefully by next Friday, we can have it on its way. Um, and so stay tuned and uh, and please do participate if there are other House or Senate committees who are working on this language. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks, have a great day. You too. So committee, we are shifting gears right now and we have uh, Representative Barbara Murphy from the Transportation Committee. And uh, I think they were, um, they were able to review the language that we are looking at this morning. Um, and so we will ask Barbara to give us uh, sort of a review of what, uh, what her committee's work on this language has been. But the, the language is being proposed by Representative Masland um, and Andrea is trying to track him down at the moment so that he can join us and uh, and tell us a little bit about the rationale for why he introduced um, this concept. And, uh, and then we'll go through some of our other uh, witnesses on it. So if everyone wants to uh, hold tight, you're welcome to turn off your camera and stand up and stretch for a moment and we will get back to it as soon as we have Representative Masland with us. Hello, Jim. Hi there, Jim, how are you? Hey, living the dream, right? Like all of us. Yeah. Under the 
I'm zooming in two places at once, but it's nice to see y'all, you know? Ways and means is, if you hear some chatter in the background, I'm trying to move far enough away from my other device so I'm not confusing things here. Yes, well, thank you, Jim, for uh, for jumping from one Zoom to another. You are multi-talented <laughs> to be able to Zoom in two locations at once. Yeah, um, well. Must mean that you, you have uh, you have good um, broadband signal if you're able to, to double Zoom. Um, easy fiber. Good enough. Oh, that is good stuff, yes. Um, oh. So we are just beginning our, uh, our deliberation on the proposal that you are making around the use of town general and highway funds. And so I wanted to yep. give you the first word on this and then sure. we will hear from the uh, the Transportation Committee on their consideration of it and yep. also Legislative Council. So go right ahead and tell us what this is about. Okay, nice to see you all. Um, if I'm looking sideways, it's because I'm trying to figure out how you can see me while, you know, working on this iPad, but don't worry about that. Um, uh, yes, sir, this, or yes, ma'am, this idea came from first from the Thefford Select Board, who, given the current situation with funds, wanted to know if they could transfer money, use money in the trans in their. Let me back up. Thefford votes its highway budget and its town general fund budget separately. And as I understand it, there are a number of towns that still do that, although not all towns do. And so, the Thefford Select Board Chair Nick Clark wanted to know what would it take so that they could move money from one fund to the other. And I originally asked Ledge Council to uh, propose an amendment that would delete section uh, 312 from Title 19, which is highway funding. And Anthea um, wrote me back that if we were to do that, we would have to not withstand some other parts of Title 19. And so I elected talking with Kurt or maybe it was emailing Kurt and, um, and several other people to try to craft a narrow bill that would be good for this, this year to enable some, you could say joint use of funds or moving from transportation to general and back and forth um, and not try to tackle this year, um, getting rid of section 312 altogether. And as I learned, not surprisingly in house transportation earlier this morning, um, there are kind of crazy things here and there throughout the statutes and in some municipalities as as we learn as we spend our time in the halls in the state house that would make doing um, getting rid of section 312 altogether are kind of complicated. Um, I think it was Barbara no it was Patty um, who pointed out that in Bolt Pulteney they have a town and a village they vote there budget separately in those categories. And I was not interested in running afoul of town traditions or making the amendment so complicated that the whole thing would fall apart given the circumstances that we find ourselves in this year. So hence the fairly narrowly crafted um, amendment, which would enable towns to use town raised tax money only that is raised in the town for the town general fund and the town highway fund to move them um, as they would need to balance budgets. And um, as, as um, Representative Murphy may describe, um, um, uh, VLCT would be interested in scrapping section 312 altogether, but there are a number of things that would have to happen before we got to that point in time which was not my intent for this year. So there we have it, Madam Chair. That's the whole soup to nuts, I think. Excellent. Uh, Mike Merwicki has a question. Well, I, I just, I was having trouble following because there was a lot of background noise there. Um, oh. Let me move. Let me move further away from the other Zoom meeting. Okay, so I think that um, Mike, did you want to did you want to ask Jim to repeat what he said to us, or are you just letting us know that it's not an easy? If he communication? was going to continue, I would ask for. If he was going to continue, I would ask for 
something different. But if he's done, then let's. Okay. I, Great. I can ask any question, answer questions at an appropriate time. Great. Thank you, Jim. Um, does anyone have questions for Jim on the rationale for, for what he is proposing here? Okay, I think what would be super helpful is to look at the, the words of this um, narrowly crafted uh, amendment concept. And uh, I don't know if Anthea or Tucker wanna jump in on, uh, on sharing with us what the effect of this is. All right, Anthea gets the quick draw. Either that or you and Tucker had already uh, negotiated who was going to work with us on this. Thank you, Anthea. You're welcome. So for the record, Anthea Dexter Cooper, Office of Legislative Counsel. Um, I already ran through this for House Transportation this morning. Uh, so I, I think I'll, I'll start off and Tucker can chime in with all of the unique quirks that municipalities have if uh, that is something that the, the committee is interested in hearing more about. I'm sure um, it is. <laughs> so, um, Andrea, I don't know if you could put that up or give me sharing abilities. I think it is posted to the committee page. All right, your co host. Great. Okay, so this is uh, drafted as being an amendment to 345, which would just strike section to the effective dates and insert a new section. Um, the lead in language is very similar to language that this committee has seen in terms of some of the other temporary municipal powers you've created, except we're adding in a specific call out to notwithstand 19 ESA section 312, which is um, a statute that if you look at the, you know how in um, online it says at the end of the statutes when it was added, it makes it seem like the statute 19 BSA section 312 was added in 1986. Tucker and I have done some digging and we think that the statute was most definitely not added in 1986, but rather that's when title 19 was recodified. And that this statute, which talks about town highway taxes is probably um, a relic of the way that revenue used to be raised by towns. But as I learned this morning, listening to some of the members of House Transportation uh, talk about their different municipalities, it seems like there is um, a number of different ways that municipalities talk about their town highway taxes. So 19 BSA section 312 is the piece that we know we need to not withstand. Uh, subdivisions one and two are laying out what municipalities can do for this temporary period due to COVID-19. And it's borrowing in both directions, allowing money appropriated from property taxes for the highway expenditures to go to general fund. That's subdivision one at lines 11 down to 13. And then in the reverse lines 14 to 16 with subdivision two, allowing the money that's in uh, general government expenditures to go to town highways. Subsection B, gives what the municipalities need to do in order to make this borrow the trade. Um, this language is just like language you've seen um, in, I wanna say it's S-344. It requires a majority vote of the legislative body and the power expires on January 1, 2021. And then just to be safe in subsection C, we are clarifying once again that it really is just the town highway budget that's raised from property taxes and saying that it is not any state aid for town highways that's distributed under 19 VSA section 306. So that's the town highway aid that's done by miles along with um, the town highway bridges and the town highway structures grants. So we're saying in subsection A, it only applies to the municipal property tax money. And then we're saying in subsection B, and it doesn't apply to this other pot of money. We're saying in subsection D, that this section does not alleviate the municipality of any matching obligations that they have if they have federal or state money that they're matching with local funds. Subsection uh, E explains how this is just a borrow and that any of the money that is borrowed under this section needs to be paid back no later than December 31st of 2021, so giving them a year and it's at a rate that the legislative body of the municipality shall determine. And then since we have struck out section two of 345 with this amendment, we're adding it in as section three and saying that the entire act shall take effect on passage. 
Great. Thank you much. Um, committee members, any questions for Anthea on the words on the page? All right, Mike, you've got your hand up. All right. Super. Okay, so um, let's throw this over to Karen Horn and hear. Um, or excuse me. Actually, I'm gonna I'm gonna ask Barbara Murphy to uh, to characterize for us some of the conversation that the House Transportation Committee had on this. So thank you, Barbara, for being with us. Thank you. For the record, Representative Barbara Murphy from Fairfax, Vice Chair of House Transportation. And we were very pleased this morning to hear from Representative Maslin um, the, the rationale for requesting this amendment. When we hear that people want to play with highway funds, we get a little concerned. <laughs> so it's good to know what the rationale is. And it truly is something that's hopefully going to help some of the small towns be able to um, use flexibility in the funds they do have to meet their obligations. And we appreciate all of the brackets on it that would have these funds be paid back to their proper accounting line and make everything whole. Um, the committee did take a straw poll vote on, on the amendment and supported it 11 0, 0. Great. Thank you very much. Karen Horn. Thank you. Thanks for taking up this issue as well. Um, I'll say that we do support the, this amendment um, in light of the current situation with COVID-19 and the, the fact that some towns are not going to be able to use all their locally voted um, highway line item dollars this year, but they are being asked to do some things that they never actually anticipated. Um, purchasing personal protective equipment, addressing split shifts, you know, cleaning supplies, those kinds of things. So we, we do welcome the flexibility that this uh, bill provides. And we agree that it needs to be very clear that it's only relating to the town property taxes that are in the uh, locally voted budget and not to any state dollars or federal dollars around transportation. Having said that, I would ask you to keep in the back of your minds um, talking about eliminating section 312 of Title 19, uh, maybe next session. And um, we don't, don't raise town highway taxes anymore. We raise property taxes and in some cases, local option taxes. Um, general accounting practices allow for transfers between line items in municipal budgets and in state budgets. That's what you're doing with the Budget Adjustment Act. And um, it also provides standards for how you account for those and how you make the funds whole. So I realize particularly after this morning in house transportation that this is your conversation and more long-term conversation. But I would ask you to keep in the back of your mind that um, this is something we may wanna revisit in the next session. Great. Thank you. So Tucker Anderson, can you join us and, um, and help us with, um, the historical context around uh, the separation of highway and general funds for, for municipalities. Sure, I can offer a very small amount of information. Um, my initials are on this amendment next to Anthea's, but it's kind of like Ringo Starr getting songwriting credit. Um, <laughs> I, was, I was in the room, but... Uh, wasn't necessarily putting any notation on the lines. Um, Anthea pretty much covered the general information. We did a little bit of digging and uh, the notes for when the section 312 was added to title 19 uh, harken back to the recodification of the title. And there are no earlier notes in the records that we have available to us remotely um, for the origin of 
that particular statute. Um, some of our best guesses based on uh, the information that we have is that this is actually tied to something from the early 20th century, perhaps late 19th century, when <laughs> town, road, and highway taxes were required by statute. Um, that is no longer the case. The issue that comes up when something like this lingers for the better part of a century is that uh, since it was not repealed or altered, there are likely other statutes that are dependent on its existence. We have a lot of cross references in the VSA and uh, because these funds have been historically uh, segregated, there may be programs and I'm not familiar with any of them really that are dependent on the existence of a segregated fund. Um, and one of the things that Anthea mentioned in the amendment is when towns are required to dedicate matching funds to secure certain state grants, there may be some connection there. Um, so that's a little bit of history and just a general comment that sometimes uh, you only find the first part of the worm in the apple. And when you dig, you find a little bit more. Well, now that's uh, <clears throat> that's a, a vivid description. Um, does anyone have questions for either Tucker or Anthea on um, on what we're doing here? All right. Uh, if there are no questions, I'll open it up to a committee discussion about um, uh, favorability, unfavorability, concerns, more information you need, et cetera. So feel free to jump into committee discussion. Yes, Jim. <laughs> oh, wait, sorry. You didn't have your hand up. <laughs> Jim Harrison always has his hand up first, so um, I'm just conditioned to uh, to call on him. All right. Um, can anyone enlighten me as to the um, on the agenda? This says S three forty five. I'm not remembering what that is. John. Thank you. So um, S-345 is a very um, short bill um, which changes the notice requirements um, for warning meetings um, and allows um, that instead of having to notice meetings in two physical locations within a, a municipality, um, two electronic notifications um, can be be utilized instead, and that the municipal body um, sh should post a notice in or near clerk's office and also provide a copy of the notice to um, the general circulation newspaper. Okay. Um, so it's all about notice. This is something that we took testimony on um, probably more than a week ago. Yes. Good, good. All right, and what is the status of, of 345 at this moment? Is that, a, is that a new committee bill that the Senate sent over to us that they created post COVID or did they strip some language from another bill? Where is it in the process? It passed the Senate. Okay, great. All right, so committee that, it, that um, completes the folks that we needed to hear from today. Um, and if you don't have any other questions, I think we can thank Representative Maslin for uh, multitasking this morning and, um, and let him get back to single tasking. So thank you, Jim, for being with us. Thank you, I, I don't, I'm muted, I guess, but thank you. Yeah, take care. Ciao. All right. I think we'll remute him. There we go. Good deal. Okay. Um, so, uh, Tucker, where did you go?
There's Tucker. Hi. So Tucker, um, is there a concern about this being germane to provisions of S-345? I do not have enough guidance on uh, the parliamentary basis for a germaneness challenge being upheld. Um, and from what I understand, whether or not an amendment is germane is a question for the body as a whole to determine and is not a question that is readily answered prior to the body assembling for that question. Okay, then. Committee, do you have any concerns about that? I'm, I'm thinking that because these are all COVID response um, amendments that we're making to statute that, uh, that nobody's going to call foul on it. Jim? Yeah, I mean, I guess if you wanted to feel more comfortable, you know, Bill McGill is usually about giving you a heads up whether he would see it as germane or not germane. Uh, and obviously it's germane until someone asks. Right, so. it's assumed to be. So right. if we don't have any red flags, then that's, uh, then that's a good sign. Um, John Gannon. Thank you. Um, so, you know, originally the, the idea with the CUD language was to make it part of um, H948. Um, and I know um, Representative McCoy raised a, a germane issue with respect to doing that. And that's why I think we left it as a separate bill. So in our current environment, um, making sure the rules committee is, is fine with adding this to 345 um, and allowing it to move forward, it might be good to check in with them. I can appreciate that because um, nothing bums me out more than having, um, having something crash and burn on the floor and <laughs> crashing and burning on the Zoom floor is probably even worse. Um, Rob LeClaire. Well, I was just gonna say in light of the dance we had to do on 948, anything we can do to alleviate that would be very, I think, wise indeed. All right, well, let's, uh, let's give this a little bit of time to work its way through that process. We'll have some, um, some conversations offline about it and um, I will be in touch uh, with committee members about when we want to come back together to take an official action on this. Um, any other questions, thoughts, concerns, perspectives you think you'd like to hear on this? Nobody's, nobody's diving for their, uh, for their uh, um, unmute button or raise hand button. So uh, that completes the business that we have before the committee today. So I think we can uh, close down the meeting and we'll see each other virtually tomorrow on the floor.